Hello, welcome to Oakville Matters. Today, let's talk about affordable housing. Everything I hear from people about housing in Oakville is that housing needs to be more affordable. There are new tools available to municipalities to try to make more affordable housing happen. And with us today to discuss these ideas and to get a general conversation going in our community about whether they apply to us, whether we want to use them or not, are three people who know quite a bit about housing. I'm going to start at the far end of my table with Peter DeRosa, who is not only the head of one of Oakville's oldest residence associations, he's a realtor in Oakville and his business is selling homes to, uh, to people. So he knows a little bit about affordability. In the middle of the table is Kurt Benson, and Kurt Benson is the the Director of Planning Services, and more importantly, the Chief Planning Official of the Region of Halton, and I'll get him to explain that unique role that uh, the Region of Halton plays in housing and planning. And also Gary Gagoris. Gary Gagoris runs Mattamy in the Hamilton-Halton area, and he is uh, therefore the biggest home builder in our area as far as I know how to judge, and if I'm wrong about that, he'll tell me uh, how close to being the biggest he is. Gary, let's, let's clear that up first. Is Mattamy the number one home builder in Halton? In terms of market share, I would agree with you, Rob, yes. And in Oakville? Yes. And Kurt, the chief planning official, uh, that, that, un, that, uh, that title explaining it, I think unlocks uh, some important information people need to know about the role of the province and the region in terms of directing the local municipalities, which I've learned to say alphabetically, Burlington, Halton Hills, Milton, and Oakville. Uh, that, that's right. I think, uh, you know, Halton uh, has a, a bunch of different powers uh, delegated to it from uh, the province of Ontario. Um, one of them is the, the housing portfolio. So we are required to, uh, to, to plan for affordable housing and make sure that it's happening in our region. And you, in aid of that, uh, you're also required to report periodically on how you're doing. That's am, correct. Am I right? Yeah, every, every year we do have a, uh, we publish a state of housing report, uh, and that uh, provides some... Is this uh, it? That is it, yes. It provides some very good data and statistics about uh, the state of housing um, uh, relative to the question of, um, you know, are we meeting some of the goals that we're setting for ourselves with respect to the provision of affordable housing. And the goals that we set are market-oriented, are they, are they not? Yeah, in most cases they are, yes. So people's incomes change, uh, the price of housing changes. Um, as a result, what we define as affordable has to change as we go. That's right. I, I think you know, affordability is uh, is really dynamic. You know, it's derived from the income of those people who um, you know want to either enter the market or or, or, or maintain uh, their place in the market. And so, um, so we have to um, keep our eye on um, you know um, what is you know affordable by by lo looking at different data sources. And I think the uh, the state of housing report does that for us annually. It provides that that good information. So the council can make uh, you know good decisions on on uh, you know how to uh, support and increase our uh, affordable housing. Yeah. Now I know that uh, the people who build homes uh, have told me that they they tend to keep track of who their buyers are so that they better understand the market. And Peter, you see buyers as well. And uh, our council has been concerned for a couple of years now. Uh, we've had a bit of a roller coaster, a, a very weird market for the last, I would say, two, two and a half years. Um, it was always the case that Oakville real estate appreciated annually by more than inflation. But over the last two, three years, we saw incredible uh, uh, levels of appreciation. We saw, uh, we got the impression at one point that houses were going up 20 to 50 percent a year in value. So who did you see? coming in and buying these houses at uh, what, you know, by definition, affordable uh, kind of means is anybody buying it, and people are buying homes. So where are these buyers coming from? Well, Who uh, is affording uh, this? You're, you're, <laughs> you're quite right. We deal with affordability uh, on a daily basis, and, uh, and obviously that is a, a term that is defined differently depending on, on the category of people who are buying these homes. Uh, the market uh, um, this year is uh, is resuming some sensible some sensible levels. So there is a, a 
uh, for lack of a better word, a, a downturn, but it's coming down from very, very high increases. Um, when we talk about uh, homes, single family homes, uh, selling in excess of 70, uh, uh, one million dollars, uh, that in the single family uh, dwellings detached represents 71 percent of total homes sold. Um, so th it's a large portion of the business. These uh, the people who are ac accessing those homes uh, usually are uh, in the older uh, generation uh, with uh, not the same financial uh, issues that that a younger generation would come up. Uh, the, real, the, the, the real question of affordability asks itself with uh, the new millenniums and um, young professionals who are uh, trying to start a family and uh, uh, getting into the workplace. And the harsh reality of it is, is that, um, um, you know, often they're, they're, they're faced with the idea of uh, not living in Oakville or um, and therefore, moving out to more more affordable areas like like Milton, although Milton is is uh, having its own uh, its own issues of affordability, um, they're faced with having to rent, and rents are going up. So there's a statistic that uh, came came out not too long ago is that the average uh, Toronto proper leads. Uh, the market across Canada as far as the rental rates. So the average uh, two-bedroom two -bedroom condo is uh, approximately $2,300. So if one would to do, uh, use that as a benchmark and say, okay, what, if I had to pay $2,300 and, and I could afford to meet the criteria of the 30% household income, what house could I afford in Oakville for that same price? And if you do the numbers uh, and take into account all of the other factors that come into play, um, that would not afford you more, very much more than uh, $500,000, dollars yeah. home. So uh, let's go back to the, the, the sales. What, what I'm uh, fascinated by is uh, my undergraduate degrees in economics. So if you, if you have two people bidding against each other for an expensive home, those two people can afford it, so it's affordable to them. Yes, of course. And um, and if you have your market being bid up by people, like we did for the last two or three years, it says that affordability exists for some, and what you've pointed out very wisely, I think, is that there's, a, there's some disparity in income and affordability. Uh, some people can afford to spend a lot, other people can't. Um, now, I've uh, I've been around the housing market for longer than uh, I really want to admit. The first three places that Wendy and I lived in our life were rentals. We were we lived in apartments, small apartments, because it was all we could afford. Uh, back when houses were cheaper, uh, uh, pay was lower too, <laughs> and uh, and we had to save up and. Uh, and work really hard to buy our first home. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, uh, but where this leads us to is, I think there's another segment besides the young millennials who need affordable housing. I think there's a, a wave of baby boomers, seniors, about to, a tidal wave about to break on the rocks of the housing industry, and they're gonna be wanting affordable housing uh, to, in which to downsize. And, um, and you're quite right. That is the other end of the spectrum, whereby you have uh, uh, seniors who are sitting on a fair amount of uh, property value, looking to to downsize, and really not uh, having the alternative uh, to stay in their communities. Uh, they don't have their requirements for a large home is no longer there. They need some very basic, um, you know, size of a home. But um, the big trauma for a senior who who sells his home, he is faced today with having to move out of the area that he so much loves because affordability does not allow him to stay. I'm uh, still unpacked from the last time I moved like 15 years ago and the part I hate most about moving is packing and unpacking so I think I identify with that. Now Kurt, um, we have uh, 
uh, up to 2016 anyway, in Oakville, uh, I'm delighted to say, uh, statistically at least, overachieved on the province's goal of 30% of new housing being affordable. And uh, so this is a segment of the market that's not the same thing as the resale housing that Peter was just talking about. And uh, my favorite statistic in this whole report is that 69% of all uh, new affordable housing in Halton was in Oakville. And uh, the other companion statistic that I remember is that 45% uh, of new housing in Oakville was affordable, not, not just the target of 30%. And, uh, and so, Gary, to some degree or other, you're delivering that. Yep. You and your, your colleagues in the business are delivering that. But, Kurt, uh, I accept that the, the craziness in the market in, in 2017, uh, and, you know, a 2016 report obviously uh, may be challenged to be super current. Like, it, we could be a year or two out of date on these numbers. The big changes that, that we've seen in the market, uh, those statistics I just cited that I'm so proud of, uh, they may well have changed. Uh, what can we do? Uh, are there any new tools that the province has handed down that we could use to, uh, in the local municipalities, uh, continue to, or if the recent market has disturbed our success, our track record of success, what can we do to make sure that we can provide the amount of affordable housing that the millennials that Peter identified and the seniors that, for some reason I'm concerned about, uh, I, I might be one, uh, what kind of tools have we got uh, that we can start using? Because I don't think we've, we're using them. Yeah. No, I, I think the, uh, the success in large part can be attributed to, um, you know, a, a, a trend to go to a different housing type and a different type of, uh, or, or a, essentially a, a mix of, of housing options. And I think, you know, thanks to, um, you know, folks like Gary, um, they are generating uh, new housing that is, uh, you know, a, a much more dense, um, you know, a, a mix of, of uh, unit types and sizes. And I think that really helps us, you know, contribute to our goal of providing a product that is, uh, you know, in the more affordable range. Um, in terms of new tools, um, though I think we were um, quite pleased that the province was looking at um, uh, inclusionary zoning as a, a potential tool that municipalities can use to, um, I guess, partner with the development community uh, to provide, um, you know, uh, new units that will retain affordability in the long term and not going to be impacted by, uh, you know, those uh, drastic changes in the marketplace that we've saw over the last couple of years. So the, the piece of inclusionary zoning that is uh, getting my attention is it there's an element of it that keeps the housing you the affordable housing you create it keeps it affordable by using contracts similar to what Habitat for Humanity does in order to protect the affordability of the homes they build so that you aren't just handing somebody a uh, really cheap house which they can then flip and uh, then all of a sudden you're minus an affordable unit. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and in the way this, the, the report I read said, uh, Ontario is encouraging that uh, first the resale price is restricted and second the, uh, the share, the, the proceeds, the, the profit of, of any resale are, are shared with the municipality um, in order to help generate more affordable housing. Uh, Gary, uh, in terms of uh, uh, your understanding, uh, I mean, your train, your your background, your experience, your training is in planning, and uh, and you graduated from uh, being a, a urban planner or municipal planner to being a home builder, and your company's gone from being known for single family homes to the the full mix, yes. as far as I I know, like yeah. like everything from townhouses to condos and 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 beyond. Yeah. Um, what what prospect do you see of, uh, and you live here, you've lived here as longer than I've lived here, yep. so you understand the town as well as the rest of us. So my, my question to you is, 
is inclusionary zoning an opportunity for us to deal with those two segments of the population that need affordable housing, the, the young and the old? Uh, it's certainly one of the tools in the toolbox. Um, but I, I think to Kurt's point... Well, we're not required to use it. No, no, it, it's, it's purely uh, permissive by a municipality. It's not mandated, so you have the ability to choose where and how and, um, and sort of made in Oakville type of solution. Uh, I think to Kurt's point, though, the, the whole directive of, of planning in the province has gone from growing out to up. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding, uh, uh, the industry is adapting to the marketplace. And so to be able to deliver that first level entry buyer, uh, generally it's intrinsic affordability, which means that the units are generally smaller and or more dense, more units on less land. And you'll find, I'm assuming, if you dug in behind the numbers of the 2016 report, that many of those units would be in condominium apartments. Not all, but, but, but many of them, which is, which is a, a type of the market that was traditionally very back-end loaded, meaning it came not at the front end of the community, it came after we finished all the, what we would call grade-related product, the singles, the semis, and the townhouses. If you drive along Dundas today, I think you're starting to see the reverse. Yeah. That, that they're being delivered concurrent with the balance of the community, which isn't a bad thing. And, and it's actually not, I mean, it, it is a good development, very welcomed by Oakville Council. But Oakville Council, I can tell you, continues to be concerned that the, the higher density and more affordable product needs to come sooner. And uh, another tool besides inclusionary zoning that's now in the toolbox is the community planning permit system. Did I get it right? You did. And um, uh, across North Oakville, where we have a huge amount of area left to be built out, uh, uh, I, could, I could say confidently that uh, uh, council sentiment, we haven't voted on it, but council sentiment is that uh, the CPP <coughs> system uh, would allow us to um, uh, use phasing to, uh, and we might not actually need a CPP system to use phasing, but um, if we wanted to make a, something that was really efficient for everybody, including the builders, the CPP system recommends itself where, you know, in return for certainty, uh, the, the council gets the, uh, the progression, the, the order from high to medium to low instead of low, medium to high. So, uh, Kurt, uh, I'm, I'm too much of a non-professional to be discussing CPP. I've read the reports, but I'm a, I'm a mayor, not a planner. Can you help our viewers understand the community planning permit system uh, better than I can? Well, I'll, I'll try and I'll ask Gary to, to fill in the gaps here. But, um, it, it was a tool that was um, that was put forward by the province about uh, a decade ago. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't really got a whole lot of take up amongst uh, you know municipalities across the province. And I think um, what it entails is is really trying to get. Um, a lot of the very detailed design uh, nailed down at the front end of the process. So you're at really uh, prescribing what the community uh, looks like and some of those design aspects of the community, what's, what the composition of the community is, the, uh, the mix of, of land uses, um, in, as, in as great of detail as possible at the front end. Uh, which essentially provides certainty for uh, for what design is. Now, there is an opportunity for um, you know landowners to come in and 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 to vary the design, um, but, but the expectation is not it, it won't be varying the design to such a degree that it looks like a totally different community. Um, I think that tool, in tandem with uh, inclusionary zoning, um, could really help um, um, lay out what the vision is for a particular area. Um, and I I, I think. Um, you know, you have all your tough conversations and, and community debates and, and engagement at that front end. I think what, what's put uh, planners off of, uh, you know, immediately adopting the tool from the province is that, you know, it, it's a lot of work. It, yeah, the public consultation piece really grows big. And, um, and I think what, uh, so Peter and I both come out of the residence associations phenomenon or movement in Oakville. And 
uh, his residence association and, my, and the one I came out of, uh, the dominant expectation has been, could we just know what to expect? We want the, so it's not just the builders who want certainty, it's the residents who want certainty. They don't, nobody likes surprises apparently. And, uh, uh, and they, they want a vision that, they want to know what the town is going to grow into. They, they don't want to, they don't want to be surprised, they don't want to wait and see. They, they kind of, they run their lives this way. They plan their lives, they want the town to be planned. So the, the, the cost up front is it takes longer to do your official plan because you've got to consult so much more. But we enjoyed the success we enjoyed with the Livable Oakville plan because of the extra consultation that we did. And I think if we had been alive to the CPP piece back then, uh, people would have liked it even more because of that certainty. Um, uh, I know that uh, as a residence association, having one fight after, you know, uh, lot by lot by lot, it gets exhausting mm -hmm. and you get frustrated with that. Uh, I would cheerfully invest the time ahead of time to nail things down. And uh, depending on how it got nailed down, you might very well prefer a system where you could just build homes, which is instead of fight a lot, because building homes is really what you're about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the CPP has a role to play. Uh, I wouldn't uh, subscribe to suggesting that it apply to all of North Oakville, but there's certainly some components of North Oakville where I think it, it's not only appropriate, it actually should be put in place. Yeah, well, there's some parts that are done, so <laughs> it's a little late. <laughs> yeah, but there, but there are other elements of the CPP that create the as you've said, the certainty, and, and yes, it's a lot of work up front, but it should inevitably create the certainty that the industry needs to be able to deliver. So it's effectively you go from the planning stage to building permit stage and not a lot of dialogue in between because there's no need because it's all done, which which put, sets everyone's expectations, which I think I think's good for the community, it's good for the industry, and ultimately good for the consumer because we know it's just a matter of pulling a building permit. Yeah, we tell people when you, when you buy a house, you should go to the town and check the planning for the area around your neighborhood. Uh, to my shock, nobody does that, or very few people do that. Uh, but as a as a as a mayor, uh, the most uncomfortable moments are when they have done it and something has changed, and they they feel like they got a bad bargain. Yeah. And fortunately, that doesn't happen very much in Oakville anymore. But when I moved here, it seemed to go on every day. And a livable Oakville plan is way, way closer to certainty, but, uh, but uh, really people want to be comfortable in their homes and they want to devote their energy to their families. Peter, uh, <coughs> in the established areas where we, where we do resale, there's probably not a lot of um, opportunity for uh, seniors to downsize, all that's, you know, I know that seniors in well-established areas would like to downsize in their area, but there is no place, uh, with a few exceptions. We may, may, we may be on track to building some affordable seniors housing in your neighborhood as a result of that seniors housing district that we're mm -hmm. talking about on the old hospital lands. But, but in, in terms of moving the needle, that small project isn't, isn't going to change the, the course of history. No, certainly it's going it's to, uh, that would be well received in, in that small area, but it's certainly uh, uh, limited. Um, in order to, uh, to have an Oak Hill uh, wide impact, uh, you have to be, think a little bigger than that. But certainly uh, the, the seniors that uh, I represent uh, would love uh, the opportunity to stay in their neighborhood. And um, the fact that we're th even thinking about it is, uh, is very encouraging that way. So. Yeah, I was at a, your annual meeting the other day and there was a lady who said uh, that she hopes it comes soon because she wants to move there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I remember joking with her that I thought she'd make it. Uh, so on, on inclusionary zoning and community planning, uh, Kurt, uh, where do you think we'll go? I mean, you, you, you gave a hint as to your role as the chief planning official. 
but you're, you have a leadership role in terms of what we do in our split level form of government. Uh, you've probably heard two tier government before, but I'm pioneering this new way of describing this upper tier and lower tier. We live in a split level government. We've got half of the things that a, that a complete city, like say Hamilton or Guelph do, being done in a cooperative uh, that's run by the four local municipalities. And, and up there in that cooperative, we have uh, the overall <laughs> general planning services of uh, not only the regional planning department, but your role as the chief planning official. Uh, and uh, you're not going to argue with me that that's a leadership role, are you? Not at all. No. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Leader, <laughs> where, do you, where do you think we might go? Well, well, well I think um, you, you kind of framed it uh, appropriately because it is a, it's a partnership, and we always view it as a partnership. There are certain you know, policy directives that, that we would like to uh, apply, but we want, really need to make sure that uh, you know, there is capacity and a willingness and, and, and uh, um, you know, an approach that, that we can define with our local uh, municipal partners. So um, the inclusionary zoning tool, for example, was one that was re really recently uh, passed through regulation by the province. I believe it was April uh, of, of this year. Uh, so we really haven't had a chance to, to come to the table with our local municipal partners to define, okay, well, what does it mean for us? You know, how are we going to advance this particular tool in our communities and what does it look like? So those conversations are, are, are about to begin uh, and I, I'm sure uh, both regional council and the local councils will be hearing about, uh, about the progress of some of those discussions and what that looks like very so shortly. The, the four local municipalities are busy doing their obligatory um, uh, review of their official plans. I, I hesitated because uh, they're supposed to be done every five years and I'm not sure we ever make that mark. Uh, in my own case, I think we might be seven years, but, but we're doing it. That's the important thing. And then at the region, you're doing the same thing for the same reason, because you're obliged to do it. Yeah. And we're, so we're trying to do these in concert, where we talk to each other. Uh, and as I understand it, both the inclusionary zoning business and the community planning business have to be um, provided for in our official plans if we're going to use them. Um, and, uh, and so what kind of... Uh, uh, what about the community planning piece? Is that yeah. already on the table? Yeah. So, so you're, you're correct. I think in order to take full advantage of those tools, we will need to lay out how we're going to use those tools in uh, not only the regional plan, but the local plans. And, and these statutory reviews are, are, are the ideal uh, you know, time to, to implement those. Uh, okay. Well, we're, we're out of time, but you said the key thing, which is we're about to start looking at this. And that means there's no better time than the present to make sure you're involved and putting in your two cents worth. Thanks for being with us today on Oakville Matters.